what that means, because these are great and grand words. Um, what can possibly go wrong? I have two mics, one on each side, and I have my notes here, and I have the clicker here. So this is a recipe for disaster, but I'm trying to not go wrong. I am Alexandra Mecklenburg, and I am one part of a team. And there is another part of the team, which is actually Sam Brown. And Sam Brown would have loved to be here today, but she's trying to figure out how to keep a very young baby alive. And she said that she is, yeah, very focused on that. Together, we are actually consequential. And consequential is a social innovation um, practice, we would say. And we love working in the field of convening, conversations, culture, and considered imagination. And I have stolen that from somebody who said to me, actually, strategy is considered imagination. And I love that. So I'm, I'm totally owning that at the moment. Um, we have a fabulous panel here. We also have two amazing sign interpreters. And I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves in a minute, um, one by one. But um, I've sorted them in alphabetical order because that is how my sad brain works. So don't try to figure out who's sitting where. You're going to figure that out in a minute. Why unpanel? Well, the interesting thing was that um, when we got the brief for this today, it was A, because we were cross-cutting um, fellows. I always want to say cost-cutting fellows, but uh, that is probably not very appropriate. We were cross-cutting fellows in the program, and we really helped, hopefully, some of you to start to think about responsible technology. I, I, I can recognize some people here who we worked with, with consequence workshops, so thinking about what would be the consequence of an action? What are intended consequences? What are unintended consequences? And I had the pleasure to work with quite a lot of you on a one-to-one -to, -one to wrangle. What does responsibility mean for us in our startup, in our organization? What does that mean in context with data? What does that mean in context with technology? And I remember, Ruby, we had some really fantastic in-depth conversations about Little Robert, so I really enjoyed that. I'm quite sad this is over because that has always been one of my highlights. Today is all about questions, that was our brief. And the brief was also do a panel. And hereby lies the conundrum, because I don't know about you, but when I get invited to a panel, my heart sinks a little bit. Because it is a format that is pretending to be deeply engaging, and it is to be pretending to be conversational. And what it is very often is that it is a lightly scripted, space where people talk alongside each other and it is all about answers and nobody really listens to the question because the question has been sent out beforehand and everybody has prepared their answers. So um, Sam and I went like, maybe we do it differently today and we're going to create an unpanel. And the unpanel is, let's just call it out as it is. Rather than trying to have a panel on this rather large question, which is how could we build more equitable creative industries, we're going to ask each of our panelists to give us a lightning talk of three minutes. Don't pretend it's a panel, it's not, it's a lightning talk, and it's hopefully going to inspire you, give you a point of view from their um, background on this question. And then I'm going to pose a question to all of us, you, esteemed audience. We also have an amazing esteemed virtual audience who are going to listen to us, and they're able to engage via Zoom. Um, and the panel, I'm going to give you one question. You're going to wrangle it. I would love you to work in little groups, do it, kind of dance with the time. I'm going to give you five minutes to explore the question after the lightning talks. And then I'm going to take two questions out of the audience and potentially two questions out of the virtual audience. The reason I'm pointing there, this is very clearly where the virtual audience is. Um, this is where the internet lives. Um, because Melissa uh, Blackburn is actually moderating the virtual audience and she sits around the corner. Oh, no. See? So this is the structure. Lightning talks first, and we're going to go around the table. Then I'm going to pose the question to all of you. Then you're going to give me two questions back, and the panel is going to try to wrangle those questions. And we're going to try to do all of that within an hour. Good luck, us.
because time is of the matter, I have given this amazingly old-fashioned honk device. So what will happen, panel, and I think I've warned you about this, um, you have three minutes for your lightning talk. After two minutes, there is one um, very um, loving honk. And after three minutes, there is a less loving honk. And it is literally, please stop and sit down. Excellent. I think that's fine. We haven't, we haven't rehearsed that, but that sounds awesome. <laughs> that sounds very, very good. OK, we're starting with the lightning talks. And because I am good in many things, but I'm not very good in names, I need that to remember to ask people. Elizabeth, would you be able to start the lightning talk? Maybe say a little bit who you are, and um, the time is starting now. and civic and social inequality in the 21st century. So I started early on on a journey of activism and I ended at innovation. Well, I'm here at innovation, not ended. Um, and it is an absolute honor to share um, space and time with you all. And hopefully, um, in a snapshot, I'm gonna give you a few ideas which will support the mission uh, to build a more equitable and inclusive creative industry. So first section is, what is the journey from activism to innovation? Um, then I'll chat about how we can build a distributive by design e ecosystem within the creative economy. And then finally, I'll end on what we can do, to what we can start doing right now. So I'll begin with the first point, um, um, from activism to innovation. So More Than a Moment was born during the Black Lives Matter movement, and it started with a call to action in the West Midlands creative sector. Um, the fundamental mission was to build a future that leaves no one behind, and we did that through listening, co-creation, collaboration, and then launching the More Than a Moment pledge, which over 100 organizations signed up to. We used the research and data to understand the scale of change that was required in the sector, and also measure progress tangibly, um, and this resulted in the last year alone, about £1.7 million invested into the black creative workforce and £2.2 million for ethnically diverse community. 80% of organisations who have signed up to the pledge now have a policy in place to combat racial discrimination in the workplace. 21% of those organisations are capturing data on wellbeing. In our data capture, we can be specific now about what organisations need to focus on to be more equitable, to be uh, more inclusive. And I want to really highlight that not all of the transformations required are monetary. Okay, that leads on to my next point. Um, how can we build a more distributive by design ecosystem <laughs> no, within the creative economy? Um, and what does the, so what does the future look like and what do we need um, to make sure that we build um, those resources? Um, so one, we need to work uh, collaboratively as an ecosystem. Two, we need to invest in innovation. What do the jobs of the future look like? Um, and how can we make sure that the communities who face historic injustice are at the forefront of new opportunities? For example, how can we make more green VR producers um, and make sure we've got um, development programs looking at multiple challenges at the same time? Um, and how can we make more cross-sectoral collaborations? Um, and then finally, where do we find skills and talent? So actually, how can we invest in building that um, infrastructure? Um, Maybe it's a fun LinkedIn, YouTube type thing. We're building it. Um, finally, um, what can we start doing right now? Um, this one's simple. Start talking to underserved communities. Start advocating uh, for new investment in creative innovation. And most importantly, imagination. And start co-creating. Um, if you've got power, use it. Um, and distribute the power that you hold. OK. That is fantastic. So we have a little bit of an audio problem. So I'm trying to project. If you can't hear me, can you wave? But also, I'm going to ask the panelists to project a little bit, because apparently it kind of doesn't work well with the live stream. So thank you so much. That was awesome. Three minutes of deep, deep, deep ideas, questions, and thoughts. Uh, Ruby, uh, would you like to kick off? And um, if we can start the time now. Okay, I don't think I can match that piece of absolute beauty, especially because I haven't prepared quite as well as you have. Um, but I'll talk about myself. I'm Ruby Sant. I run an art CIC called Little Lost Robot. And what we essentially do is we build robots out of scrap with people. And you think, oh, great, what a, like, that sounds like a niche thing. But actually, it's really important. And the reason it's really important is because we seriously need to disrupt the narrative that tech has to be white shiny, new, environmentally detrimental. And 
When you take that away, tech becomes more welcoming and it becomes for everyone. The other reason it's really important is that when you go and take, we have these like robot boxes with the LiDAR in and an Arduino in and they react to things. And we take them out to communities who are just, they're not interested. They're like, why would we build a robot? What's that? And we get bits of cardboard and we get bits of crochet and we get fabric and we get bits of plastic and we go, right, what do you want your robot to look like? And people make things. And as you make things, you have big conversations. And the conversations are actually around AI because you're like, why does a robot have to be a human? What could a robot do? What is a robot? And what do we want them to look like in the future? And having those conversations with people on the ground is vital. Because otherwise, we as a community and as a society don't have any say in the things that are happening up here. So the reason Lost Robot is working so well in the community work it does is that we give people the chance to have these really big conversations about artificial intelligence and what that actually means for all of us, about issues with data discrimination, about issues with design, about inclusivity. And we also disrupt this tech narrative. I mean, I don't know if anyone else saw Neptune Cross by Saul Williams, but that, you know, tech should not always be new. We should not be digging up and setting fire to the planet for tech. So that's the first thing I was going to talk about. The second thing I was going to say that I'm really excited about um, is co-creating and designing robots for people for a better future, and also 3D printing. Now, 3D printing can be awful and wasteful and bad, but it can also be a fully recyclable system that can happen in-house. So seriously, like seizing the means of production, we can have our own villages, we can cut off a supply chain with lorries and ships going across the world, and we can print stuff at home because data is the thing that has value when we can print our own kit. So that's the other thing we work on that I'm really excited about. <laughs> See, there's something beautiful about giving people a certain amount of time. Um, Simon, that might be a little more challenging. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, wave if you can't. I'm doing my best projecty voice. Sorry if I'm yelling in someone's ear at home. Um, I could try and come back if that helps. I'll do that. Is this a count against my time yet? Am I just, you know, fascinating. <laughs> So my name's Simon Morton, I'm Associate Professor of Creative Economies at the University of West of England and I'm part of the team that uh, designed Britain's Art Project r and and helped deliver it as well. Uh, lots of my work is based around the idea of creativity as a political concept and what happens when things get done in its name. So the first thing that I was going to say, and like how might we reach change, is one of the empowering things is to realise that there's no such thing as the creative industries. They don't really exist. About 25 years ago, a bunch of people got together and decided to look at a map of different kinds of industries, not a geographical map, and draw a little line around the outside and say what was inside the creative industry was that time world. And that's kind of it. If we know that, we can start to reject it. So one of the challenges of that kind of definition is if we take like a cookie cutter approach to mycelium, chop, we chop up all of the amazing things that create the fruits that you see in the mushrooms. So we have a government who wants to count all the things that grow, all the fungi, the bits at the top, but they don't seem to understand all the stuff that contributes underneath it. It sits outside in a category of particular kinds of, uh, of industrial definition. So the second thing that I like to say is to look below the waterline. And what I mean by this, we're continuing the subterranean vibe, is um, some writers called uh, J.K. Gibson Graham came up with this idea of an iceberg that represents capital or um, capital labor as it's waged. The very top bit you can see above the sea is the stuff that you get paid for, that exchange, that wage exchange of work. All the bit underneath is all the other millions of kinds of interactions we have on a daily basis that are not qualified as valuable because they're not economic. Childcare is the most obvious one in terms of the history of capitalism, but there's loads of them. There's sharing, there's pet sitting for your friend, there's giving somebody a something from your allotment, like a courgette that you've got too many of. There's all kinds of ways we generate value and exchange for one another. And those are the things that frequently lead to the mushrooms that we like to count. So thinking about counting them, I want to say something quickly about measurements and how measurements have morals. And we can actually choose what we measure and what we lobby for when we're trying to redesign our creative sector, our creative economy. So um, stealing something from a talk by... Uh, 
Jonathan Gross, who uh, talks about Diana Coyle's book, uh, GDP, a brief but, <coughs> my notes say a brief but addiction history, I think it's a brief but affectionate history, <laughs> about GDP, the standard measure of the value added created through the production of goods and services in a country during a certain period. So we're very familiar with this idea that we count money, right? We count the money, we make the money, we're going to stuff. But did you know that Simon Kuznets, who is one of the uh, architects of GDP, actually suggested that there are a number of things that should have been detracted from a country's GDP, and that was military, advertising, and finance speculation activities, i.e. the more you did those, the, more you, the worse off you came. So, <laughs> that's it. Thank you, Simon. It's amazing. It's, it's a tour between mushrooms, zucchini, and icebergs. Absolutely awesome. <laughs> Tony. Hello, everyone. Is this loud enough? Yeah? OK. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tony. I am the inclusion producer on Bristol and Bath Creative r and I'm part of the Watershed team. It's really interesting. Alex, uh, before this uh, panel today, asked me to talk about the idea of opportunities for change. And the notion of opportunities for change and the process of creating change is something that I've been reflecting on quite a lot recently. Uh, in my two years working on Bristol and Bath Creative R&D, thinking about what inclusion practice might mean for us and the companies and the organisations and the institutions that we collaborate with and support, um, I often find myself asking questions around, well, where can change come from and what might that change look like? This work has culminated in an inclusion framework for change, conveniently enough. Um, an invite to teams to come into an invite to teams that are developing products or projects or processes um, to explore the moments in which they might engage their customers or their audiences and how those moments might be made more human or more inclusive. The idea that I want to share with you all today is this. The opportunities for change are finite, but the possibilities for change within those moments are not. We can, and I do, spend all day talking very, very ethereally about equity and inclusion and what those things might mean. But our chances to put any of those carefully constructed nuanced thoughts into action are few and far between. You only have a few key instances in which you can demonstrate your values or to build a new relationship. And you have to get it right because the stakes are really high. Luckily, there's a bazillion ways that you can do that that work for you and, crucially, centre the person that you're trying to engage. Often when considering change to processes, conversations focus on deficit. We talk about, oh, we can't afford that, or we don't have the capacity for this, or we don't have the audience that has those needs. The opportunity for change that I'd like to see is a shift to an asset-based approach to equity and to inclusion, asking questions like, well, what can we do with what we have? And even better, what can we do now and what can we plan for later? That is not a blank check to park everything for later either. If you can't do X, can you do Y? What is your plan for later? What's missing that means that you can't do it now? What power do you need and what power do you have to make it happen? How do you build capacity to do it? Where will the resources needed be sourced from? No more excuses, only actions. The prospect of building a whole new equitable creative economy sounds huge and complicated, but I really don't think it is. I'm going to talk more about this later, but I think that as long as you start by clearly defining your audience and articulating your intention in relation to them, and then keep coming back to them at every point, the feature of our products, processes, and policies will be inherently better because of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. And Zoe, last but certainly not least. Ah, I don't know. What lineup to follow? I've been feeling quite nervous and intimidated about being on this panel. Um, and I've been making so many notes as you guys were speaking, being like, oh, I need to mention this, this, this. Um, but I've been feeling intimidated because these are some really big questions. And kind of as Simon was saying, um, the creative industries don't exist in silo. Like, to have a more equitable industry, to have a more equitable economy, we need massive changes of our, of our systems and infrastructures um, and and for me I've, I've previous to this I've wrestled with this kind of stuff like all this massive change that needs to happen and it can feel quite like, debilitating and um, it's kind of hard to feel your power um, when wrestling with these massive changes that need to happen so um, recently we went and visited a, an organization called Civic Square and they posed a question for me which has been more um, conducive to action and more helpful for me which was thinking about okay um, what do we need to thrive? What are the conditions that we need to thrive and thrive in balance? Can people hear me? 
a bit up, all right. What do we need to thrive in balance? Um, and, and when I say that, I mean what do we need as individuals? What do our communities need? What does our sector need? Um, but what does our ecosystem need as well? What do we, do we need um, to thrive? What does that mean? What does that look like? And that feels like, okay, I can think about that. What does that mean? Um, I'm really, uh, I find hope. Um, I haven't even said what I do. I'm the environmental researcher at Watershed and Bristol and Bath Creative R&D. So I spend a lot of my time thinking about climate change, which can be quite sad and scary. Um, and I found real hope in looking at kind of different ways of imagining the future, utopian thinking, solar punk. Um, and it talks about a harmony between people, nature, and technology as fundamental for a, more, a better future, basically. Um, which I find really beautiful and I find really inspiring. But that's really big, again, <laughs> it's really, really big and it doesn't feel very tangible. So part of what I've been thinking about is, okay, what are the things that I have to do today? And what are the things that we all have to do? The, the, the KPIs we've got to meet, um, the reporting we've got to do, the things that we've got to do. How do we do all those, those things now while creating and building capacity for longer term, more transformative change? How do we hold both of those and think about, as Tony was saying, where are the opportunities to make the changes now but build for something that we might not even know what it looks like yet? Um, where do I need to push back um, and where do I need to create oppor opportunities for other people to come in, other people to speak and build capacity beyond just myself for transformative long term change? Um, and for me, that thinks, thinking about bridging silos of action, um, thinking about my work in climate and Tony's work in inclusion and trying to bring those together more tangibly so that they're not acting in separate. Um, and it's pushed for me, it's pushing back against um, metrics of uh, environmental action, just being carbon reduction, just being reducing carbon, but thinking about framing climate action as something that's more transformative and inclusive to make life better for people, for communities, for nature, rather than just... 25% less carbon than last year, if that makes sense. Okay, I'm done. <laughs>So frankly, Zoe, it was pretty awesome that we were last because you managed to wrap it all beautifully up. So you made my job very, very easy. Um, what we heard was five points of views on what are opportunities. And I think what I heard is that there is an awful lot of overlap. And that's what makes me hopeful because I believe that the power sits in the overlap. And as you said, Zoe, in trying to link these things together, work together, don't define yourself out of the box talking about, I don't know, was it the mycelium versus the cookie cutter? It was the mycelium versus the cookie cutter. So also start to think as a mycelium rather than a cookie cutter. I stopped this analogy now because it's getting a bit weird. What I promised you, that actually now you are going to do a little of work and there's actually space for conversation. So what we're going to do now is hopefully this has given you inspiration. Maybe some of the things you heard, you go, hmm, I need to understand that better. And you know what? Maybe your neighbor knows a little bit about that or maybe your neighbor has a different question. So what I would love to do is to put a very big question out to all of us now, which is this. What do you want to see in the future of equitable creative economies? And in your little groups, you can think personally, you can think practically, you're very invited to think philosophically. And what I would like to get back from you, and I'm going to get two people to volunteer at the end to share the questions that you might have wrangled in your little groups, is what questions do we need to ask collectively now to get there? And those questions you will then pose to the panel, who is actually wrangling around exactly the same thing. And I will keep this slide up, because if you are like me, the moment somebody explains what to do is the moment I forget what they just said. So we're going to leave that up there. Talk in small groups, big groups. It's actually a really nice room. Turn around, there might be sitting like in the, in, the, in the airplane, right? The emergency exit might be actually right behind you. So there might be an amazing human sitting right behind you who you might want to have a conversation about. I'm going to give you, because we actually have the time, see, I'm going to look for time at this thing, which will not tell me the time. We're going to have 10 minutes for you to wrangle those questions and come up with a question that you think will help us to get there. And then we're going to ask the panel to ruminate a little bit on that. Does that make sense? Fantastic, I'll leave you to it, 10 minutes. We're going to honk after nine minutes 
and then we're going to stop. And what I'm going to do, I don't think we have uh, mics anymore, so I'm going to then ask you to just project back into the group. If you want to, you're very welcome. I'm going to ask one of you. If you want to, you will be very welcome to come here and pose your question. If you don't, just project out of the audience. Is that clear? Everybody clear what's happening? Amazing. Time is starting now. Okay, how was that? Can we get back in the room? Hello. I think there's still, this is a good sign. It's a good sign that I have to kind of lovingly interrupt you. Did you have some good conversations? Excellent. I also don't mind if you did not exactly talk about that. I am generally happy if you connect with each other and if something comes out of it. This table got all into mycelium. We were so deep in the mycelium, it was amazing. I think there was one suggestion just, I think that was you, Ruby, wasn't it? What does that mean that we should just leave it all for 200 years and then pick it back up? And I think, <laughs> I think there was a, a, a clear point of view that is not right. So what we're going to do is, we, I, I saw Melissa just now. Yeah, Melissa is here. Exactly, she's here, she sneaked in. Melissa is the representation of the internet today. Um, so I would love two voices out of um, the audience to pose their question to the panel. Are there, have you landed on a good question? How we can work as collective and maybe challenge like big tech or bigger corporations with like other creative ideas or just like other like business models. So what would you have to say with that kind of thing? Could you, you know, no? you just get the back? Yes. So basically just like challenging big tech and kind of how you challenge them with both the ideas you'd come up with and also like business models. So how would you like um, kind of go around that in terms of like uh, uh, both uh, businessly and like creatively. How would you take down tech billionaires? Well, not take <laughs> down. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's a bit out of the question. I think we should take them down. Is that, is that an interpretation that you're comfortable with? Well, I mean, <laughs> like you can talk about how you want kind of hey, thing, so I don't mind. So who would like to speak about that? But what I liked is when you started to talk, how can we do that collectively, I think, I thought also was really, really interesting. So how can we start to change the narrative and take maybe people and concepts down? Who would like to start? I think this is where art is at the front and centre of the work. I think in the creative industries and in the creative sector in terms of filmmaking, storytelling, music, art, all of those things drive narratives and I think that they give hope. I think that if we have stories of hope and other voices that are uplifted into that space and also if we can imagine better futures than the one we currently have then I feel like we have a starting point to change that's more collective. The problem is is that it's very hard to be heard, isn't it? You know. So I think the real question is like, how do you uplift a wider slew of voices so it's not just the same people saying, oh well, we're all doomed? Because if we all think we're doomed, we're not going to make any change. You know. We have to have that hope. Like I was saying about, I'm really into Afrofuturist sci-fi. It's like a bit of a subgenre, but mainly it's just sci-fi that isn't just about white middle-aged guys. Because like a lot of sci-fi for a long time is about white middle-aged guys. And for me personally. I find my hope by going away and reading that because I'm like, oh, here's a future where actually they've, they've solved some of these problems and this is maybe the journey that they went to get there. And they may not be futures that we'll ever live, but having the idea that there are some futures out there is really good. Amazing. Is there somebody who wants to jump off that idea? Elizabeth, yeah. I don't think I finished thinking. I'm going to try and finish my thoughts. Um, I think that big tech as we know, is massive at the moment. And I think that what the creative industries could 
do is, is sort of one learn from how they've sort of grown so quickly and then compete so what i mean by that is you know we've got they've, they've created a blueprint that we could not necessarily use well use some of it but actually then compete by investing in platforms that support our creators because actually a big challenge is that a lot of artists especially underserved artists don't have enough income to sort of you know pay their bills and so actually how can we use a version of what they have done to build platforms for our creators so that we can broaden out our network and then actually make competing yeah, compete with, with, with what they're doing but to the point where it's enough not where it's sort of destroying people and the planet to be honest so i think that's where my thought process is um yes. brilliant simon anything to add yeah i think it's it's also about unpicking the myth particularly of the individual genius within things like the tech, the tech sector. I mean, we're seeing it at the moment with Elon Musk, right? We see it, you know, in Bill Gates onwards and, and Apple and stuff. And a lot of those ideas about the Silicon Valley lone genius who goes off into their garage and creates a uh, revolution, that's baked into the creative industry's policy and understanding that if you're a visual artist, that's how it's going to work for you as well. And the truth is, those people were not working on their own. They were not working at removed from other kinds of people. They were already collective. I mean, what they've done is got really good at hoovering up everybody else into their collectiveness. So you could also start by trying to break some of that kind of um, essentialist myth that the, the, the low geniuses are doing this kind of work as well. That is a cultural thing as well as the practical. Because actually they're the whole. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Thank you for that question. That was great. And hopefully people can start to think about that over and above. Melissa, is there some question from our online oh, audience? Online. That's a very small question. Yes. Um, Do you want me to say that again? What are the business and decision making structures that are generative, creative, and useful? Who would like to take that, Tony? Um, my question back to that is who are you trying to make it useful for? Um, and that's absolutely, if you can start with understanding the answer to that question, then you can think about how it can be generative and whatever the third word was that you said in that question, Melissa. Um, but it's the point that I was making earlier, you really need to start with an understanding of the communities that you're trying to serve and the people that you're trying to build for and towards and then ask them. Uh, like, uh, you'd be surprised how often I spend in my days going, have you asked them? Do they want it? Do they want it from you? Is a question that I ask those three questions once a day, I think. Um, but they're really useful design questions, um, and it's a great starting point. Love that. Super practical. Tip, actually, <laughs> really, I'm going to take that away. Um, Zoe, just nodding. Just yeah, I'm agreeing. Just yeah. There's a population happening here. Elizabeth? Um, so I'm at the beginning of uh, going on my business journey, um, and this is actually something that's been quite, I've been thinking about quite a lot. Um, and so I think just in response to what you were saying, Tony, it's who are we accountable to? Um, and one, it's the next generation, also the planet, and then actually how do you make the business sort of work and then work for everyone. So, you know, again, looking at the future, what do the creative communities need? How can we make sure that in everything that we're designing, it's better in the lives of the creative communities and the, and the planet? And hopefully um, making sure that the next generation can also sort of take versions of it. Um, of what we're trying to do through the innovation lab in the moment. So I guess like, for me it's about how do we design a board that re reflects the communities that we're trying to serve, also the next generation of, of amazing people and also um, how do we make sure that just on the economic level that the business is okay so that we can Can you the hear? Next, of businesses too. I, I, next time just a little bit louder because I think we're losing the last four or five lines here. Ruby? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd add to that, I think you need to trust the process. I think especially if you're like reliant on funding from people and you get the funding and you have to agree that you're gonna recruit a certain number of people and they're gonna do this, this and this, that can be really scary because you're always like, well, maybe I'll fail. And I think it's really important to be okay about occasionally failing and getting it wrong. And I think the process of testing and being relaxed about that is really important. I think that if you don't, 
if you don't lean into the process, then you're going in there with a fixed idea about how you want things to be. And actually, especially if you're doing like really good community work, you shouldn't have that fixed agenda. You should just be saying, right, I'm going to try this, and I'm going to see who comes, and I'm going to see what they think. And if they, if they don't like it, we'll change it. And that's good. And that's really good, because then you're you're building collectively and I think that long term for any arts organisation you can't one person can't hold an arts organisation it's too much you have to be able to have a process and a collective vision that can be passed on because that's how you ensure longevity I just saw some very deep felt nods here <laughs> um, in the uh, in the audience and I um, I sit on the board of an arts organisation and the last couple of weeks were a bit of a roller coaster I think um, another question from the audience in the space. Yes, ice cream delivery woman. <laughs> it's ice cream delivery Lego woman. <laughs> um, it really fits to um, what Ruby just said. We wanted to ask, how do you keep imperfection in the process? Nice. How do you keep imperfection in the process? Who would like to take that one? Make space. How do you make space for perfection, Simon? Well, I think one of the things that we, we talk about a lot, and by we, I, I've talked about Watershed and Claire and all that, this kind of stuff, is the different kinds of value that you base and that you measure or count or describe your organisation against. If you make space in your kind of DNA for the idea that imperfection is part of a process, that it is a legitimate outcome, that the way that you talk and present your work always kind of has that, and you embody it. That's a starting place. So I get this needle sort of principle to borrow from some consequential kind of language as well. You know, it's sort of a value or a kind of a lived way of doing things. And we were talking about imperfection in, in technology just now as well, weren't we? I don't know if you want to say something about the <laughs> evil of tech. sorry, the evil of uh, the, the alleged perfection of technology. Yeah. I think that one of the things that makes it really hard to work between art and tech is that art is by its very nature messy and domestic and human and tech is shiny and sleek and white and cold and I think you have to take the shell off the tech really to make it work and I also think that as an organisation on a really practical level you have to be vulnerable and you have to admit it when you get things wrong because we all get things wrong and you have to be really careful about who you work with because some companies do not like imperfection and some companies actively embrace it and when you build your relationships with those companies then you start having a steady organisation that will actually work and live and thrive because you're building around your own humanity rather than around an idea of who you are as an artist. Great. Um, I just, sorry, go ahead. I'll quickly go. I think my thoughts form about half the speed of you guys. Um, you're all amazing, what you're coming out with. Um, so this is a half-formed thought, but I think there's something just really like simple about um, mess is risk, and to risk we need to care about each other. It needs to care needs to be rooted in our like, interpersonal relationships and the risks that we're taking. I don't really know what that means, but like I think that can be on the micro scale, and then you can think about different ways to build that in more, more purposefully. But yeah, I think it's about caring and. and Loving each other. <laughs> yeah. I love that. How can you design care into those processes? And what does care mean to you? Can also probably mean different things in different organizations. And how do you live care is probably another question. I think we have one more question from the audience, from the virtual audience. No? Oh, fantastic. In this mighty room. Yes, and there is a mic which can help you articulate that mighty question. But, um, so we were talking about the challenges of getting long-term funding um, to work with underserved communities rather than with this sort of parachuting in and parachuting out of places and finding ways of involving the communities in the management and the evaluation of the projects in the place. Um, and kind of finding a way of evaluating that doesn't involve lots of tick boxes and metrics and actually spending all your time doing that rather than doing the work that you want to do. Lovely. So I'm hearing long-term funding, I'm hearing how can we create an evaluation system that is not becoming an extra burden but it is actually helping the system. Who would like to say something about that? Um. <laughs> Well, we've done some of this with Lost Robot, and there's two things there. So long-term funding is a nightmare, isn't it? I mean, we all, we all feel that. 
I think that we're, we're starting to get a bit sustainable as a small art CIC by um, having different income streams. So we're not reliant on the Arts Council, for example. We've got a strong relationship with the local council. We have a little bit of commission-based work that keeps us ticking over, and we have projects that we run. Um, so sustainability is something that you can build up over time. I think it's really important that you don't parachute into anywhere um, because nobody wants that. <laughs> um, and I think the only way you can do that well is by being really slow and gentle with your processes, which is really hard when you're freelance because you're faced this wall with like you've got a three month project window and actually this project actually, let's be fair, it takes six months to a year to build any artistic group or network well, right? So this three month thing, we all know that it doesn't work, but we're kind of constricted to a certain extent. So I think for us personally, we try and run a project that runs for a year and then maybe we'll put a little bit of one bit of funding in and we'll put a little bit of another bit of funding and we find ways of making sure that the projects that we do all fit within the same remit of the work that we care about. So essentially we'll have lots of different funding pots but they all serve the same purpose and that's like how we do it developmentally. Evaluation wise, we've just chucked surveys out the window because we hate them and the other thing we hate is the outcome star. I don't know if anyone's ever dealt with that but it is nasty and it's not okay to ask people really traumatising things about their lives to get your stats. So we play games, we do games, we're making a whack-a-mole where you can hit the thing that you want to think about, we're making big weather barometers so you can check your weather. We try and embed it as like a creative part of the story, like the evaluation should be as powerful as the experience, like it should be part of the experience, you should have that like, that power, you know? <laughs> you know what, Ruby, that's an awesome place to stop. Um, and also I think you are going to be very happy because we made up for about six minutes, so you are awesome and you are also awesome. I thank you so much. For me, this was really easy because I really just had to fill the holes in between the talk. Um, and thank you for being here. Um, and maybe you take some of those questions out of this room and start to ruminate a bit more about it. You can take a picture and then just talk about it over uh, a coffee or uh, a beer or an alcohol-free um, beverage. I love you and leave you and uh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much.